Okay, thank you for having me. Um, uh, by way of background, my name is again Christian Barth. I am an attorney and a writer, more of a writer than an attorney. Um, in 2020, the Garden State Parkway Murders was published by Wild Blue Press. It took me nine years about to write. Um, a lot of times people ask me, you know, how did you get interested in this story? And I tell them it, it comes down to just a boyhood memory. We were driving north along the Garden State Parkway coming home from a beach vacation because that's where that's where we would go um, for several weeks during the summertime. And as a boy, as I drove north, my parents were in the car driving north along the parkway. I'd always look out into the woods um, and just sort of become entranced by, you know, what, what mysteries I was certain lurk therein. And I remember we were near Ocean City and my mother said to my father, they never found out who killed those girls, did they? And I said, what girls? And I sort of learned just a tiny bit of the story there. And then it sort of remained dormant until 1993 when I read an article by Larry Lewis of the Philadelphia Inquirer indicating that serial killer Ted Bundy had uh, basically admitted to killing Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry. He didn't come out and say it, but he made a series of cryptic remarks which sort of served as the, as the basis for my um, interest in the case moving forward. And it's about that point in my life where I decided I wanted to write a book about it. Uh, I wrote a fictionalized book about it at 11 years ago called The Origins of Infamy, which is told entirely from Ted Bundy's point of view, fictionalized again. And then with the excess research that I had at my disposal, I uh, came up with the idea that I would write the true story. And that's what I did for about 10 years, contacted every um, living state police detective um, you know, that would talk um, and, and just did a deep, 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 almost obsessive dive into the case. And, uh, and that, that's what turned out to be the Garden State Parkway murders. So I'd be happy to take any, uh, any questions that anyone had. I'm, I know that um, I, I thank you all for, you know, for coming here and, um, you know, talking to me. I, I'm more than happy to discuss the case um, you know, to the extent that I'm able to. Um, I was like saying earlier, um, I've continued in my efforts to um, research the case, gather facts, even after the publication of the book. It, it's, it continues to fascinate me and interest me. So it's not as though I put it aside. Um, so as I said, I'm happy to answer any questions any of you might have um, you know, regarding my writing. Really, every, everything's fair game. So on Friday, um, three days prior to that, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry, both 19-year-olds and friends from Monticello College in Illinois, decided to take a trip to Ocean City, New Jersey, uh, along the Jersey Shore. It was actually Elizabeth's first trip to the Jersey Shore. The idea was to spend three days um, vacationing at the Jersey Shore and then going from there, the two of them, Susan and Elizabeth, to meet Susan's parents in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, just outside the state capital of Harrisburg, to join them for the trip down to North Carolina to Duke University to watch Susan's older brother graduate. Um, they got there on a Tuesday, registered at Walter Sybin's boarding house at 712 Ninth Street in Ocean City, right by the boardwalk, stayed for a few days, um, left at approximately 4.30 a.m. on Friday morning, May 30th, um, got in their car, which is Susan's car, a light blue convertible and drove the mile or so over the bridge and stopped to eat at the Summers Point Diner. Approximately 6 a.m. Um, they got there, they stayed for about 45 minutes. People saw them in the diner, but they didn't see them leave or get in their car. And it was according to coroner's reports about 45 minutes after um, they had left the diner um, that um, they were murdered. Their bodies were found about 219 feet into the side of the Parkway Woods between mile marker 31.8 and 31.9. Susan um, was nude, face down, had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest um, and had been beaten as well. Um, Elizabeth was nearby her. Elizabeth was fully clothed except for her shoes and underwear. Um, uh, neither woman had been sexually assaulted. It was actually a, a terrible, unfortunate delay that happened. 
um, between the time the girl's car was found abandoned on the side of the parkway. So well, let me take it back a little bit uh, before the murders. At about 8 a.m. or so that morning, uh, Trooper Lewis Sturr um, was driving along the parkway and noticed uh, a blue convertible unoccupied, pulled over um, to check it and saw nothing amiss. He did see a straw person there, but it didn't look like it had run out of gas. And he ordered it towed to Blazer's Garage in Northfield nearby and left for a fishing vacation after his shift ended that morning. And when he returned three days later, he noticed that the girls had been reported missing. And in his while while he was absent, you know, Susan Davis's parents and Elizabeth Perry's parents both were understandably frantic, contacted New Jersey State Police, the Ocean City Police Department, rented a helicopter to search, and no one could find out what had happened to the girls nor the car because again the car had been towed so that's that's sort of the start of the story um, on May 30th um, again they left and went to the diner and were murdered sometime thereafter their car was found abandoned on the side of the road towed and it wasn't until three days later after they disappeared that a search was commenced on Monday afternoon June 2nd in the early afternoon 15 minutes into the search is when Woody Fonts, who was a parkway maintenance worker, discovered the bodies of Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry. It didn't take long into the search when he found them. So that, that's, that's the very, very short version of, of May 30th to June 2nd. Did they even have any suspects straight away or no? Not right away. Uh, they interviewed several uh, people. The first persons they interviewed were, and I, I sound somewhat hesitant because, but they apparently between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m., they did meet two boys. Um, these persons were never identified. I've pretty much made it my duty to find the names of all these people. And I don't think anything happened between these. They left from there at about 4.30 after meeting these two guys and went to the diner. At the diner, they met three boys um, who were each interviewed um, and passed lie detector tests. One of the guys was named Bill McMonagle. Uh, he was a warrant officer in Philadelphia. I interviewed him and he was somewhat reluctant to talk about it, but he basically concurred with what the newspaper version was. You know, he actually had gone into the Summers Point Diner, which in 1969 was packed 24 hours a day because it was right by Tony Martz and Bayshores and all these bars that had let out and everyone would go right over to the diner to eat. So it was, it was pretty crowded, but he and his friends just occupied the table um, where they were seated. You know, some, some friendly conversations ensued. He in fact said that he didn't believe these girls were in college because they looked so young and said, let me see your ID, jokingly. But they got up to leave and again, they left the girls behind them and traveled on home. And, and, and that was the last they saw of them. Um, so those are the, the first, again, the first couple of days. Um, June 4th or 5th, I want to say June 4th was a Wednesday. And on Wednesday afternoon was when things started to pick up a bit. Um, George Dix was the New Jersey State Police uh, lie detector, one of, one of the persons who administered the lie detector. Um, and he was at home and he got a call from... Uh, I think it was Lieutenant Brennan or I mean, the police captain. And, and um, he said they had just heard from the Philadelphia Police Department homicide unit that they picked up an 18 year old hippie um, that afternoon because over in 13th and Market in Philadelphia, a store clerk overheard, overheard some kid talking to these girls in a store and said, I was down in Ocean City when those girls got killed. So the storekeeper contacted the uh, Philadelphia Police Department. So their homicide detectives brought the kid in for questioning, put him on the lie detector test, and he didn't do so well. Um, it didn't give conclusive enough answers to, to you know, release him as a person of interest, but obviously he wasn't in custody at the time. His name was Mark Thomas, and he figured prominently in the story later on. 
but Mark was interviewed by the uh, Philadelphia Police Department, again, gave what they called fuzzy answers to the lie detector test. They contacted the New Jersey State Police and George Dix, Harvey Burns, and I think Detective Jims Patterson went over and interviewed him well into the morning hours um, until such time when the head of the Philadelphia Homicide Department said, look, we've got an 18 hour hold on people. You either charge them or you have to let them go. And they didn't have anything to hold them. So they were getting ready to let him go. And this is just one of those strange things. They were leaving the place and all of a sudden, Mr. Thomas you know, came down and said, you know, I'll, I'll go with you. They, he said, do you wanna to go to New Jersey with us? Yeah, I'll go to New Jersey with you. So they take this 18 year old kid the detectives get in, get in the car and they're on their way over to the Delaware Memorial Bridge, at which time they realize they don't have any money for the toll. And Mark Thomas reached into his pocket and gave them 50 cents to go over there, which of course, you know, brings up the question, why would a guilty person offer not only to go back with the state police to, you know, for more grilling and interrogation, but why would he give them 50 cents? Um, so he went with them and he was actually too tired to get a good read on the polygraphs. So they brought him to a motel called the White Way Motel, let him sleep for a few hours and brought him back to the station. And around that time, word had gotten back to his parents that their son was in custody. Um, and um, the lawyer, their lawyer accompanied the parents to the Berlin barracks, which is still there um, on Route 73 in Berlin and the Berlin State Police Barracks, I should say. And at that point, Mark was released back to his parents. And that was the flurry um, that happened um, you know, during the first week. They had interviewed just about everyone, put him on the lie detector test, but he became the first quote unquote person of interest based upon the lie detector tests. He had indicated to the police that he had uh, hitchhiked home when they asked him, you know, to give a, an account of his whereabouts in the morning of the murders, and it was like five or six persons he said he hitchhiked from, and none of them were able to corroborate his account that they had, you know, given him rides home. So he always remained a mystery. Um, it, they, they continued to pursue him, follow him. Uh, Jack Kreps, who's since gone to his reward. Uh, was one of the detectives that went over to Pennsylvania um, to sort of follow Mark around, see what they could find out, talk to his friends. They actually uh, sent a guy undercover to go to the record store, I believe, where Mark worked to see if he would come up with an admission and he didn't say anything about it. Um, Jack Kreps was so dogged in his determination to find out who did this that he actually had a protective order brought against him by Mark Thomas's parents. So he couldn't really follow him as intensively as he once did. But Mark uh, became the, the primary person of interest at that time, frankly, because they just didn't have anyone else. And it, uh, a couple of weeks later, I think it was in July, um, I should say, let, let, me, let me bring it back a little bit right around the time when the local radio station had indicated that they had found the bodies, uh, a woman named Kathy Perkionen had um, heard this and she recalled uh, a story, not a story really, something that had happened to her um, a couple of weeks earlier while she was on spring break in Fort Lauderdale. She and a couple of friends from New Jersey were down there and she was, working at the time in Atlantic City at the Social Security office when she heard the story in the radio that the girls had been found. So she remembered this guy that they had met several weeks earlier in Fort Lauderdale. His name was Ronnie Walden, sort of a good looking, handsome drifter type. Um, they, Mark, I'm mean, sorry, Ronnie and his friends had invited the three girls to stay at their house one night and have dinner. And during dinner, she sat next to him and she said she noticed his watch and she looked at it, it was a dive watch and the watch said uh, 17 jewels on it. And she remembered it distinctly because she's like, jewels, this doesn't have any jewels on it. This doesn't make sense. And when she got back from spring break, after she had heard of the bodies had been found, she told the state police, like she saw this guy apparently flip out uh, in dinner, got angry at someone, just a real apoplectic rage. 
And just, she said she just felt in her bones that this guy was the one who did it, sort of that intuitive female instinct for, for things like that. So she told the police and the police were listening to her and the police said, well, was he wearing any jewelry, this person? And she said, no, I'm like, are you sure? She said, yeah. And they said, well, well, was he wearing a watch? And she said, yes. So they showed her a picture of the watch and she positively identified it as the same one that was found at the crime scene near mile marker 31.9. Uh, it was a watch that just the watch face itself and didn't have a band attached. They just found that and, the, and Susan's glasses were really the only things they found. But as far as any foreign object, incriminating piece of evidence, that was all they found was the watch. And, and she thought that it belonged to Ronnie Walden. So when the police noticed that she had positively identified the watch found at the crime scene, they put out an APB and learned that Ronnie uh, was in jail in Colorado. So two detectives from New Jersey flew out to Colorado to interview him. The day that the interview was scheduled, several hours before, uh, Ronnie tried to hang himself in his jail cell before the police interviewed him. He hung him or attempted to hang himself in the very same cell where serial killer Ted Bundy um, you know, was incarcerated before he escaped through the light fixture in the ceiling and went on to Florida State and, and murdered several co-eds. So I thought that was one of the most fascinating things about this case, which really struck me. The, the strange coincidences that these, you know, two persons, Ted would of course later be a suspect, you know, had, had been in the, the same jail cell and were both suspects in the, in the same crime, albeit at different times. So those are the first two. Um, uh, was 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 Mark Thomas and then of course Ronnie Walden, uh, but again there was just no no physical evidence to, to tie either of them to it. Uh, Ronnie, strangely enough, passed the lie detector test and he was on his way to do a ten year stint in federal jail for auto theft. So I think that's one of the reasons the police in New Jersey just sort of lost interest in him as a suspect in the Parkway murders because he was already already going away. So the case remained quiet after after those two. Um, were released and they continued to track Mark Thomas. Mark actually went, um, joined the army, uh, went AWOL, went to Canada. Um, and that's what happened in the ensuing years. Um, and what happened next as far as, you know, sort of milestones in, in 1980, serial killer uh, Gerald Stano, who wasn't characterized as a serial killer at the time, uh, was arrested in Daytona Beach, Florida, um, for the murder of a prostitute. Or actually, he was arrested for trying to attack a prostitute, and the prostitute identified him as having attacked her before. And when Paul Crow of the Daytona Beach Police Department, the chief, interviewed Gerald, he just began talking and talking and talking and confessing the cases. And once he started confessing, Detective Crow started contacting uh, places where Gerald had been. And it turned out that he grew up in the Philadelphia area uh, in Bluebell and lived one mile away from Mark Thomas in the late 1960s. And I actually, once I, I knew early on of, uh, you know, the one mile separating them. And it wasn't until a few years later, and I put this in my book, that I talked to a, new, a state police detective in Pennsylvania who said that they were acquaintances, that they knew one another, and that Gerald's younger brother, Roger, was in fact questioned by the New Jersey State Police for the, for the Parkway murders. Um, I did not know this. All I had known was that, of course, there was Mark Thomas and that Gerald Stano, or Gerald Stano, um, you know, had gone on to, uh, was, was from the area. And he wound up confessing to the Parkway murders, but he got the dates wrong. He said it was 1973. But when I spoke with Detective Crow, he said, Jerry was always off on times and, and dates and things like that. But, um, so that's what happened with Gerald Stano. Gerald uh, would go on to death row, Florida's death row in, in Stark, Florida. And for a time in 1986, both he and Ted Bundy uh, were in cells right next to one another, um, strangely enough. In 1986, uh, 
Ted Bundy was speaking with Art Norman, a death row psychologist. And this is during the time he had just received his, a six month stay of execution. And out of nowhere, um, he, he said to Art Norman, well, and he was speaking in the third person. You know, he had gone to New York to Times Square and the combination of sex, pornography and violence really pushed him over the edge. So he went to a place called the Jersey Shore, went to Ocean City and he walked around the boardwalk and he saw two girls on the beach and it wound up being the first time that he did it and he couldn't recover from it. Um, words to that effect, I'm not directly quoting what Ted had said, but strange and Art, I guess, somehow learned that these two girls, Susan and Elizabeth, had been murdered down there in this unsolved case and said, I, Ted Bundy might have done this. So he contacted Jeffrey Blitz and asked uh, Jeffrey Blitz, who was the Atlantic County, New Jersey prosecutor at the time, told him what he had said, but because Bundy didn't come out and admit it, Blitz just sort of discounted what, what Art Norman had to say. And that's where, again, the case remained uh, for a while. Um, let me take it back a bit from 1986 to 1983. Uh, in 1983, again, we have Stana who had you know, admitted to uh, the Garden State Parkway murders, confessed to them in 1980. And he continued to confess in around 1982 there was a big article in the Philadelphia Inquirer about his confessions and that he was from the area and that he had, of course, confessed to the Parkway murders. And there was a junk dealer down in Atlanta County, New Jersey, who contacted the New Jersey State Police and said, you know, on the morning of May 30th, 1969, he was driving his truck in the area about a half a mile from where the girls were killed and he saw a kid um, walking sort of furtively down the side of the road and he slowed his truck down to look at him. And just as he slowed it down, the kid dashed into the woods. So he tells this story um, to the New Jersey State Police, Detective Maholland, and Maholland gave him a lineup of five photographs and said, tell me who the guy is you saw 14 years earlier. And without hesitation, he pointed to Mark Thomas. So um, that again, reinvigorated interest in Thomas, but again, um, Detective Blitz, or actually it's Joe Fusco, who was the prosecutor uh, at that time, I think, um, one of those two. Anyway, he just decided, you know, there, look, there's nothing to this. You know, we have this guy coming around 14 years later saying this. So in 1986, um, you know, we have Bundy saying that he was, uh, you know, talking to Art Norman, saying he was at the beach and he may have been involved in it, and fast forward to 1989, the day before Ted was to be executed with most of his appeals exhausted by that point, he had chosen to speak with a criminologist or psychologist, I should say, Dorothy Lewis, who had, uh, I guess, been appointed or retained whatever by his defense team in order to help him. And second to last interview, the penultimate interview that he would give um, you know, they, she pretty much gave him a blank slate and said, you know, do whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, um, tell me what you want to talk about. And he immediately said, you know, talked about Ocean City, New Jersey, how he was down there. And this time he distinguished his marks from three years earlier saying, I didn't kill anyone. It was the first time I abducted a person um, and got away with it. But he sort of gave that as an example of one of those sort of timeline points, salient points in his life where this entity that, that he said that had built within him sort of just, just, just dying to come out and he you know, sort of felt the creative urge to kill people. But he said that was the first time that he had attempted to abduct someone. I always thought it was so strange that he could talk about anything he wanted to at that point. He was going to be executed the following morning. And with no prodding, anything along that those lines, he automatically referred to, um, you know, picking up someone and trying to abduct him in Ocean City. I had always been fascinated by the Ocean City connection um, because uh, my parents actually, actually met in Summers Point and um, we had vacation down there as well. And of course, they had come to you know, learn about the case and whatnot. But um, I had 
contacted his aunt who's, who's since passed away. And she said that in fact, and this is what I did not know, that Ted had been to Ocean City several times over the years because her mother's family, this being Ted's aunt's mother, Ted's grandmother, his parents, I want to say, had owned a place down there and he had been there several times over the years. So when you hear of serial killers sort of staying in their own backyard, the fact that he had been there several times over the years certainly lends itself to the possibility that he could have scoped out his area. But I just didn't know, um, you know the connection to Ocean City uh, and that his, his parents, and I'm sorry, his, his mother's side of the family had a house down there. It was just, just, just fascinating to me. Um, and if you, you look at, um, there's a photo that's online of Ted with his mother and his grandfather, Samuel, at the beach in Ocean City. And you can see the fishing pier at 14th Street in the background behind them. And I always thought it was just a strange omission that so many of these television producers put that picture out there at the forefront and never indicate that it's in fact taken in Ocean City. So that's, um, that's how my interest in, in Bundy arose. Um, so again, he, he's still a person of interest to this day. The police have never been able to officially exclude him. I did get calls and spoke with people over the years who said they did see him down there, some credible, some not, um, but unfortunately no one was able to produce a photograph of him. Um, so no one could really place him down there specifically at the time. One gentleman I spoke with was a graphic artist and said that on the night before the murders, he was at the Summers Point Hospital and he met him and he said he saw him get a ride from a guy named Jim Gifford, who was a Summers Point police um, officer. And that's the last time he saw him. Once, once he saw Bundy was executed, he contacted his, I think the Atlantic County Prosecutor's Office and spoke with Detective Bruce DeShields and told him that I, I saw him that night. But again, you know, the detectives really couldn't do a lot without it because he didn't have a photograph. So, and, um, you know, he was dead by that point. So they just didn't do a whole, a whole heck of a lot about that. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that was the Ted Bundy um, part of everything. And again, as I said, I, I started becoming interested in the case after that and doing my own research and sort of wondering, you know, given the time that the girls were murdered at the time of the day and, and how it happened, I've just gone over in my mind 15,000 times what I think, you know, could have happened to them on that morning, but in the time that left the diner and, and their car was pulled over. Um, a lot of people initially suspected that it was a hitchhiker who would have done this, but, and this is the big, big but, um, about a week or two weeks after the car was towed, the bodies were found, a group of, uh, Girl Scouts or Brownies were out picking flowers along the Garden State Parkway several miles north of mile marker 31.9, and they found Susan's keys, which led detectives to conclude that they had been thrown from a car, which, of course, leads one to reasonably conclude that they weren't picked up by a hitchhiker, that at some point after they had left the diner, they were followed and pulled over by someone in another car, murdered, and these people took off in their own car and left Susan's car behind. Another strange thing was that Elizabeth, both of these girls are from very affluent backgrounds. Elizabeth had on her person uh, a 14 karat gold charm bracelet and a three karat diamond ring. And whoever did this um, never took either of those, those things. So. It, it eliminated robbery as a motive. Um, you know, I always suspected, well, a, a serial killer would have done this. And I, I still obviously have that possibility open in my mind, but some of the serial killer experts with whom I spoke said a serial killer, once he saw that 
um, there was another car. There was another car that was, was parked behind Susan. It contained three boys who were from the, the uh, Folsom, Pennsylvania area. They all passed a lie detector test. And once that person pulled over Susan and Elizabeth and saw another car parked there, they would have immediately fled because the last thing a serial killer wants to do is get caught. So. So where does it stand right now? Um, after 1989, where does it stand right now, the case? Mm. Well, the case is still open. Um, that's where it is. It's, it's 53 years old. It, it's still open. Um, I met with police uh, last year, last summer, and, you know, I don't, I don't know if they have any new leads. I think at this point, you know, um, at, at this point, I just think it's going to be a matter of, excuse me a second, you know, there's going to have to be a, a, maybe a DNA um, or, or something, something like that. So, so there's got to be a break. And, and the problem was, and I say the problem, but you know, the girls weren't sexually assaulted. Um, so that's, you know, if the person left behind any any trace evidence or anything along those lines, I think it would have been discovered by now, given the advent of, of you know, genealogical research um, and DNA and so forth. But, you know, there once in 2011, I had spoken with a state police detective and his words were, we have nothing. So it's still a very, very cold case. Ted is, Ted Bundy is still very much a suspect. Um, and that's where we are. You know, I, ju I just continue to, anytime I, you know, if I'm so inclined, I, I do more research, I read into it and sort of comb the old newspapers and internet and to see if any of the persons were, you know, maybe, you know, that, that, that had committed similar crimes during that era were, were around during that time. So that's sort of where we are now. And in a nutshell, it's a cold case and it's really not going anywhere, unfortunately. Okay, there's some questions in the chat. I'm not gonna give anybody's name. Um, the patron said, I know about Ted Bundy. I've heard a little about it. And then we have another patron who said, I would like to know if CC Moore, the genetic detective was ever contacted to backtrack DNR, to identify family DNR and identify the killer. No, because I, 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 you know, I don't know who this person is. I have heard of him, but there was no, again, no DNA found at the crime scene that I'm aware of. And again, the last time that I'm aware that DNA was, at the, that the evidence that was left at the scene was checked over was in, in and around, you know, the mid two, that 2004, between 2004 and 2010, um and they had nothing so if there's that that's the problem with a lot of these cold cases um, if there's not a sexual assault and and the perpetrator didn't leave any bodily fluids you know unfortunately you know there's just not a whole heck of a lot you can do i've always suspected that there would be dna beneath one of the girl's fingernails in a, in a defensive wound posture but if there was you know, it certainly wasn't wasn't brought to my attention. Or if they did find something, you know, um, the DNA, they, you know, there wasn't a match within the CODIS database. So, as I said, I think if there were any usable DNA with today's technology, it would have been found. This is not, you know, you hear a lot of talk of trace DNA and fingerprint DNA. I have yet to see a cold case cracked by virtue of a person's you know, DNA found on a fingerprint, not the fingerprint itself, but DNA found on a fingerprint. I, I just haven't heard that. You hear the advances, but I've never heard of any cases cracked, so. Um, another patron asked, didn't Ted Bundy woo a whole family to kidnap their daughter? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Didn't Ted Bundy woo a whole family to kidnap their daughter? No, I haven't. I'm, I'm not I, aware of that. I, okay, and then another question. This is a good question. Um, what was the cause of death? Were they bludgeoned or beaten or shot? They weren't shot. They were stabbed to death each four times in the chest area. I believe each of them had a stab on four or five times. Each had a stab wound in the leg as well. Oftentimes, the police will hold back certain information from the public. 
And in this instance, it took me 10 years to find out what that piece of evidence was. Susan had her bra tied into her hair. Um, and I had, again, with, with that piece of information, I had always you know, researched cases to see if there were any other similar cases where the killer had done something. It's almost ornamental in characteristic of a serial killer who would leave signatures such as that, um, you know, do something with the person's undergarments that wasn't necessary for the perpetration of the crime. In other words, didn't use the bra to strangle her, but sort of in, in a decorative manner. So um, that's where we are on that. Any other questions? You can put them in the chat. I do. Christian, this is Jill Ayer speaking from Idaho. How are you? Great, thank you. I just wanted to know, and I may have missed this already, but um, what initiated your interest in this case? Uh, when I was a boy, uh, 12, maybe 13 years old, we were, we had always vacationed in a town called Stone Harbor um, and later Avalon. And even before I, my first memory in Ocean City, and we were driving along the Garden State Parkway once when I was about 12 or 13. And as a boy, I grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is a very developed suburban area. So my exposure to woods is really limited to summer camp each year. So I remember just sort of zoning out and looking to the woods, um, wondering what, what went on out there. And all of a sudden, my mom said, or my dad, words to the effect of, you know, they never did find out who killed those girls, did they? And I was like, wow, murder, what? And I remember my father saying that, you know, for years they put a, a, a camper or something in the woods there. That, that turned out not to be the case by the state police. They had a, had a trailer um, at the Summers Point Circle where people could pull over and <laughs> see information. But that is where I learned of it. And it stayed recessed in my memory until years and years later when an article in 1993 by a Philadelphia Inquirer writer named Larry Lewis posited that Ted Bundy, you know, had made some admissions to the case. And that's when I delved into the Ted Bundy um, connection. So that's, that's the long, I, it was a boyhood memory when we were driving along the parkway. Thank you. What do you think it'll take to get this case solved? Do you think it will be? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I think it's going to take maybe a, a person near death feels guilty, remorse. Maybe he's decide that before he meets his maker, he has to, has to come clean. Um, or it'll take DNA evidence. See, see, the problem with cold cases, and I don't wanna go into a rant too much, but I, I can only speak to New Jersey. New Jersey has what's called the Open Public Records Act, which is similar to you know the federal FOIA requested, but criminal open criminal investigations are exempt from that. So all the research I gathered, you know, was talking to police. I did come across some sensitive information over the years and, and, and learned stuff the public did not. But as far as looking at the police file itself, my, my feelings are this, and thank you for bringing this up, Jill. Until there is more transparency and more open discourse regarding cases of a certain age, let's say, let's, let's say 50 years, you know, there's, it's going to be, very difficult for cases like this to be solved. I, I believe that the more people that that review it and you know say, well, you know, I knew someone, blah 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 blah. Just I, there's just not enough transparency as it is right now with these these old old cases. Um, and I think if that relents at some point, that'll certainly increase the odds of it ever being solved. Because as I said earlier, I think if there was DNA to be had. You know, I think it would have been found by now. Do you think also that that there could be any other similar crimes within a certain radius that you feel have some similarities or could be oh, linked sure. to this? I don't know the link, but there was one in 1970 uh, in, beneath Hunts Pier in Wildwood, New Jersey, which is another resort town. They found the body of uh, Carol Hill, who was in her 20s, she was found beneath the pier. And um, the whole back in that case was a bow had been tied around her private area. 
Um, she had had stand, sand stuffed in her mouth and been strangled with a piece of an electrical cord. So the state police did do an investigation into that and tried to see if there are any similarities between that and the, the Parkway murders from a year earlier, but that's still an open case and they weren't able to do any, um, you know, draw a connection to that. So there were a lot, they, someone had written that 1974, although it's a few years after the Parkway murders and the Carroll Hill slayings, the golden age of serial killers. If you look, there are really a lot of these unsolved cases from that era. Um, and I, I've always said it's one of the reasons Bundy was able to um, you know, go about his, his murder so easily it is because of that unique era. It was before cell phones and before the omnipresent cameras. Um, you know, people were much more accepting and trusting, you know, it's like Susan and Elizabeth, their kids were still hitchhiking and getting rides. Um, and, you know, there were certain characters like Ted Bundy, and there, there are a couple of others like him that were just very glib sociopaths who were able to infiltrate the various strata of society. Um, so I think that that certainly contributed to it. But as far as there being any specific cases with that MO in 1970, there was a girl, Brantweiner, Sharon Brantweiner, who was killed in Pennsylvania. She had her, uh, she was strangled with her stockings, actually it's two pairs of stockings tied together. I did contact the police over there and I said, you know, did the New Jersey State Police ever contacted you? And he said, yes, they did contact us and there was an investigation into it. But that's the extent that he would talk, you know, police officers are, are very, very reluctant to talk about what they deem as open cases, even though these things are sometimes 50 years old. So thank you for that, Jill. And I, what I really do is that I spend a lot of time, you know, free time on this case, you know, looking for cases with similar MOs in the area and seeing if the, you know, whoever did the Parkway murders might have done another or, or vice versa. And there's just a, just a plethora of these cases. Um, that are out there, again, due to, you know, the lack of, of identification tools we had at our disposal back then, like we have today. We have a, we have a question in the Thank chat. You. Has the evidence been preserved and still available? As far as I know, sure. It's in Trenton at the um, state police headquarters in Hamilton, New Jersey is, is where it is. So as far as I know, it, it, it's all still there. They don't, they don't do anything with that. Any more questions? Just seems so needless and horrible. What it is. It girl. is. So it is. You know, and one thing. One thing that I think it's always been. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm trying to find the right word for this. Not necessarily. I would say overlooked is the specific time this happened. It's about six in the morning. So my theory is whoever did this. I think it's almost axiomatic to say that they have a mental problem, but whoever did this, I think was out drinking, doing drugs all night because several of the bars in the area were, were didn't close till 6 a.m. And I think sleeplessness sort of combined with, with the, you know, the psychosis um, added to the motive for for this person doing this. I don't think a person woke up in the morning and said, you know, I, I, uh, I went ahead and, and killed these girls and whatnot. I, I think it was a person who had been up all night. You know, the FBI, when it comes to serial killers, and again, this person may not be a serial killer, but, you know, they, they pretty much have, you know, the demographics down is, is, you know, typically, you know, serial killers are young, white males, not necessarily loners, many of them are married, such as the BTK killer out in, out in Kansas City. Um, so, you know, I, I just think the time that this happened would suggest that whoever did it maybe came from one of the bars. But again, you know, it was such a crowded place at the time. This was before Atlantic City. Summers Point was the place to be. All along the Bay Avenue, they had, you know, there was a movie called Eddie and the Cruisers was filmed there. They had several bars. They were just, it was teeming with young people. So no one really noticed, the, you know, the person, uh, you know, next to them. And, and again, the diner was crowded. 
So this person was able to just immerse himself anonymously into that crowd and get away with it. And that would account for the lack of witnesses. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. You can, uh, the link for the book is actually um, in the chat and you can get the book in the library too. We have several copies of it. Oh, we have one more question. One minute. Okay. Um, have the police ever tried to profile the killer? Sometimes they can very, they can be very accurate to the age type of person they're looking for. I, I'm unaware of it. I know I spoke with uh, several of the now deceased detectives who said, you know, criminal profiling is, is something that's been around for a long time. It's got, gained more popularity with John Douglas of the FBI and, and the recent Mindhunter series. Um, so I, I know that they apparently had retained the services. This is back in late night, again, right after it happened of a Pittsburgh forensic psychologist who believe it or not said the person was a carpenter. Um, but I've heard that term carpenter used by other psychologists as well to profiling. So that was the extent of the profiling. I, I'm not privy to any more recent profiling of it because I don't know that the there was enough evidence to suggest that a serial killer was at work again because of the unique circumstances of this murder um, and the crime scene with, with the bra tied into the hair, etc. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us yeah. tonight. And uh, also, I just wanted to say that uh, you know, in uh, sometime this winter, uh, I'll be on the Oxygen Network or Peacock or one of both of them, and the Parkway Murders is is going to be. Um, a topic of discussion in an unnamed show. So just, just something to keep your eye out for. I'll obviously post it on social media when a, a date and title becomes certain.